example, one of the things they talk about is how an A in one class might not be an A in another. Like, for example, there's some professors, and I saw this at culinary school too, who give out easy A's, but then there are other professors who won't because they see it as nobody's perfect. So you're always, you always have somewhere to improve upon. So some, some teachers I know, like they say, oh yeah, they gave most of the class A's. Other teachers, it's like they might give one person an A maybe. So that becomes a little unclear as well. Um, some courses actually have mandatory grading curves. Like you, you've probably heard about grading on a bell curve, like Georgetown's McDonough business school. So they're meant to, but the, the curves are more meant to measure the quality of rankings rather than absolute measures. So again, this gets into issues because different classes have different averages. For example, certain finance and accounting classes have 3.0 average, but most have a 3.33 average electives outside of finance and accounting typically have a 3.5 average. So again, that might be with how rigorous is the work, how tough are the professors, all that. Of course, this is more number based. So you have to be better at math. So it's probably more challenging. That'd be my guess. Whereas certain electives would be a bit easier. A grade for an individual class may be even more meaningful, but then it's like if you combine different classes together, it gets tough. Like, for example, Sally may be one out of 45 in one class, but 21 out of 45 in another class. So if she's ranked 11th between those two classes, but that doesn't really give a clear indication because – she could she could excel in English or something and then sort of be an OK student in math. And then she's considered like slightly, you know, about an average student. But it's like, is that really fair? Because maybe she's just strong in these areas and weak in these areas. So that that's sort of an issue, just even comparing class by class. Any comments or thoughts on that? Yeah, in this one, it's a simple question to people like Kenyatta University is one of the top universities here in, in Kenya. Hmm. And I, I they might have. English majors, I'm going to double check, but I'm just saying, like, why should there be a difference between an A paper in, let's say, let's say there's an English course, an English 101 course, they're reading uh, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Why should the standard of an A paper be different between Kenyatta University here, Brown University in the United States of America, or Oxford University in, uh, in the United Kingdom, or whatever the, the top university is in China? Shouldn't, I mean, sh just, just think about it. Should it be the same? Should that paper be graded by this, exactly the same by each of those institutions, by the professors teaching that English 101 course? Now, I'm not saying I'm not saying one way or the other, but it's I think the, the current status is it wouldn't be graded the same. But just in general, this is a thought experiment or it's a question to you. Uh, why would that be different? Can you defend why it should be different? Would you defend why it should be exactly the same? What, what is what is something you can go with that? Well, because I was going to add on, too, I mentioned about having for my practicals, I had chefs who were easier and they liked me. But I remember when I was taking my final one, the chefs, the two chefs right before I took it were two of the toughest chefs in school. And th those were the types who would fail people by half a point or whatever. So you think about that. It's like you also have to factor that in. Like if the students who failed with them, if they took other chefs, they might have gotten a higher grade. But then if I had those chefs, I might have failed. So it's like, you know, th those things kind of become unclear, too. But. That, but ideally, you're supposed to be grading everyone by the same standard, so it becomes a bit harder when you have the different, the chefs with the different standards and level of rigor and all that. Okay. Oh, like what? Like one example was Spätzle, the German dumpling thing. In school, we typically sauteed it, but one of these chefs was German, and he said, "Oh, in Germany, we don't sauté it." So he actually gave kids a point the kid points off for that, but the kid didn't know. So there's, there's things like that. He's like, I guess he was like, Oh, in Germany, we don't cook it this way. And it's like, well, okay, but how is the kid supposed to know that? <laughs> and then, and then it's like, but then in school and other classes, we sauteed it. And I remember when I made it, I sauteed it for the other chef and it was good. And he, I got a good mark. So it, it's like things like that. It's, you know, how do you, and then I remember one of my friends was like, Oh, I would have asked him in advance exactly what he would have wanted. And it's like, but but then do you have to do that each time? Like, you know, or would you actually have done that? I mean, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just checked and uh, they have an undergraduate of bachelor degree program of English and linguistics is from the Department of Literary Linguistics and Foreign Languages. So you see here, English is a foreign language. I don't understand. Uh, with, with Kenya, it's uh, the lingua franca, I guess, would be Swahili. And uh, English is also spoken widely towards a British colony. And then there's about uh, 40 or so, 40 or more tribes, and they normally have their own tribal dialects. But in general, if you in Nairobi, you can find people that speak English or Swahili, but then the tribal tongues are there. So here it's considered, it's still kind of considered a foreign language. Mm. But <laughs> I don't understand countries like the United States of America 
or England itself that actually have like English language majors. But they have the bachelor's in education in English and linguistics. They have a master's of English and linguistics level 700, master's of English and linguistics level 800, uh, postgraduate diploma in translation studies. Now, I think that one makes a lot of sense. I guess that would be people translating English into the different tribes and Swahili and things like that, or the inverse for people from English-speaking countries who want to do business and uh, really have different relations with people in, in Kenya. That could be important. Uh, it's a practical, I think. That's one very practical application of being, I think, an English major, I guess I would say. And I know at least one person uh, that I studied with in Rome who is actually a translator and he's done does some freelance work. He's worked with some international organizations and stuff like that. And um, master's in applied linguistics and PhD in English and linguistics. So that's the, the, the kind of stuff that's, that's there. But yeah, I'm, I'm saying with this one, why shouldn't the coursework for these things be exactly Clearly the same through those four institutions that I mentioned, Kenyatta University, the number one, one of the top universities in, in Shanghai in, the, in uh, China, or uh, Brown University, or Oxford in, in England. Why should they have different syllabus? Why should they have different uh, information and content to have somebody who at the end has a mas master's in applied linguistics? Or, or it, why should it be different? Well, I, I also got annoyed too at like how growing up the Hispanic kids would take Spanish and just ace it because they knew the class because they knew everything. I was like, is that is that is that really fair? It's like I took French. I mean, I enjoyed it, but like, but is but is that fair though? And then I had an Italian friend at another school. My school didn't offer Italian, but he did the same thing. I was like, what language did you take? He's like Italian, easy grade. He was born there, so it, so he spoke the language. Part I'm like, is this real? Is this really fair? I mean, it, it's it's like there should almost be some rule because it's like. If, I'm sorry, if you speak Spanish perfectly, why are you able to just take it and get an easy grade? Because they'd say, oh, well, you guys speak English and you're taking English classes. It's like, yes, but it's it's talking about other things. We're talking about grammatical structure. We're talking about, I mean, I guess Spanish is too, but like it's about literature. It's about writing composition, all this. If you're just writing and speaking a language you already know, I mean, and it's just, you yeah. know, most of the grammar, you know, the spelling, like, what are you really being challenged on? Like, why are you even there? <laughs> Thank you for listening. This has been a clip from an actual longer recording that I'll try to leave a link to on the screen or somewhere around here where you're listening to this. Presents. <laughs> Presents. <laughs> Presents. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay.